chapter 14. I'm going to start in verse uh, 12. So what's happened so far in the gospel is Jesus is ready to face the cross. He's at, he's at Jerusalem. He's ready to go into, you know, be taken captive on the Mount of Olives by Judas and by the men that Judas is going to bring. And he's ready to go be crucified. And as he's about to be, there's been some things that have been going on. Uh, last week we looked at uh, when, when Dave taught um, Mary anointing Jesus with oil, uh, preparing him for burial, then Judas being stirred to be the one to betray Jesus. And now we're going to look at, uh, this. they're going to have the Passover meal. This is going to be the last Passover meal that Jesus is going to have with the disciples. Then he's going to... Um, have communion with them. He's going to institute a brand new covenant. And uh, and we'll see where it goes. Awesome picture in the Word. So he's ready to go to the cross. And and before he does, they're going to have a meal together, a Passover meal. Verse 12 says, On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was being sacrificed, his disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? Okay, this is the Passover meal. This is a huge Passover feast that's going on in Jerusalem at the time. Probably about 2.5 million people in Jerusalem for this Passover feast. It's huge. Anybody been to Jerusalem? Been on a trip? Been there? Okay. 2.5 million people stuffed in that place, ready to sacrifice lambs, approximately. So the Passover lamb is a lamb that's going to be sacrificed per family. At the temple, the blood's going to be poured out down the Kidron Valley. The the lambs are going to be roasted and eaten by all the family members. That's the Passover meal. So you got 2.5 million people. You probably have about, as a minimum, 250,000 lambs that are going to be sacrificed on this day. An amazing thing. A lot of blood that's going to be shed during this Passover meal. I'm going to read to you from Deuteronomy uh, chapter 7. Chapter, I'm sorry, chapter 16, where, where Moses is giving directions to the nation of Israel about this Passover feast, literally. He says, observe the month of Abib and to celebrate the Passover of the Lord your God for the month of Abib, the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt by night. He says, you shall sacrifice the Passover to the Lord your God from the flock, from the herd, in the place where the Lord chooses to establish his name. What is happening here is God delivered the nation of Israel from Egypt. And the night before he delivered the nation of Israel from Egypt, he told the nation of Israel to sacrifice a lamb. Kill a lamb. You're going to eat that lamb with your family in your house. And before I remove you from bondage, you take the blood of that lamb and you take it and you swab it on the doorposts of your door and on the lintel of your door. You swab that that your door is going to be covered in blood. And that way, when when the destroyer comes down to kill the firstborn in Egypt, which is why you're going to be released, that he will not go into the home. Whoever's covered by the blood is saved. Whoever's not covered by the blood is going to die, firstborn. That's the picture that's painted there. So God told the nation of Israel through Moses, from this day forward, on this month, you will celebrate this feast. And it is a feast to celebrate. You know, sometimes we celebrate Christmas and Easter, New Year's. I mean, we actually sometimes have more fun at Super Bowl parties than we do for those. We get together with family. It's a feast time. It's an enormous celebration of joy, this Passover feast. To remember that God delivered us from Egypt, from bondage, the bondage of Egypt. And he did it. By covering us in his blood, passing the blood over us so that we could be redeemed and be brought out of the nation of Israel. That's what Passover is. And this Passover feast in Mark chapter 14 is an enormous Passover feast. And it's Jesus coming down into the city. He's about to become the sacrificial lamb of God. And his blood is actually going to take away the world's sin, although they don't know that yet. What happens in Deuteronomy chapter 16 is that Moses tells the nation of Israel that God will choose the place himself for that Passover feast. 
And what's amazing is back in Mark 14, this is what Jesus is doing. His disciples come to him on the first day of, of unleavened bread, and they go, okay, we've got to sacrifice this lamb. Where do you want us to go to prepare this feast? So he's choosing a place where his name is going to be established, and that's real important. Um, verse 13, he said to his two disciples, uh, he said to them, go into the city, and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he himself will show you a large upper room furnished and ready and prepared for us there. Uh, you know, the disciples went out and came to the city and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. This is pretty wild. The preparation of the Passover feast to the disciples. All they're doing is sacrificing a lamb. All they can comprehend is we're going to have a feast, we're going to sacrifice a lamb, we're going to remember that we were delivered from the nation of Egypt, and we were taken out of bondage. And to them, it's something they do every year. It's like, it's like if we were going to just celebrate Christmas. You would just celebrate Christmas because that's what we do every year. It's like you do the same thing. We cook the same thing. We walk the same way. You get the same present. You know, <laughs> Year after year, it's the same thing. To the disciples, that's all it was. Because they couldn't comprehend that Jesus was trying to show them and teach them something. What you've been doing every year, sacrificing this lamb, is who I am. And I have come now to be the sacrificial lamb of God that's going to take away not just the sins of your life for this year, but I'm going to take away the sins of the world for eternity. I have come from God to be this Passover lamb for you. They couldn't grasp that. They couldn't comprehend it. They thought he was going to come down as, as, as the Messiah and, and conquer Rome and take over the government and begin to rule the world. That's what they comprehended. They couldn't understand what was so important to him about this Passover feast. An amazing thing that while this is going on, Jesus is constantly teaching his disciples something. And what he's teaching them here with the preparation of this Passover meal is that He's, still, he's, he's showing them, you are my disciples. I, he's been telling them, I'm going to be crucified. He told them plain, plainly, I will be crucified. I'm going to be killed by the leaders in Israel. And in, on the third day, I'm going to rise again from the dead. He's been telling it over and over and over. He's showing them something now. You're going to be the leaders when I'm gone. All right? When I'm gone... You're going to be the ones that are raised up to begin to share the message of this hope to the whole world. That's what you're going to do. But you're not going to do it the way the Pharisees have done it. You're not going to do it the way the religious leaders have done it their whole life. Because I'm teaching you something in this preparation of this Passover meal. I'm teaching you that my leaders, the leaders of my church, are going to be servant leaders. They're not going to be anything else but that. And he shows us in this picture, and it's an amazing thing. He says, uh, go into the city, and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. This is pretty wild. This term, a man will meet you. It's an amazing term of words here because it's a military term, and it implies a hostile separation. Almost like you think of it in your mind of a, of a ninja coming in and cutting somebody directly in half. Hostile separation. And you're like, okay, what does this have to do with anything? It, it means literally <clears throat> go into the city and you're going to meet a man who you will have known your whole life as hostile, yet he will have been changed and separated into another man. He says, go into the city. You're going to see a man who you've known your whole life was an angry man, a hostile man. And yet you're going to see him carrying this pitcher of water, and he's not going to be that man anymore. He's going to be a different man. Something has made a hostile separation in his life. Something has changed him from the man he was that you've known your whole life to the man that you're going to meet today. That's what he says to him. You go in there and you look for this man says he's carrying a pitcher of water. This is pretty wild because men didn't carry pitchers of water. In Jerusalem, women carried pitchers of water and servants carried pitchers of water. 
If I'm married and I'm in Jerusalem and I'm thirsty, I simply just go, honey, <clears throat> I'm thirsty. <laughs> and uh, we're out of water. And without question, without question, because it's just the way it was done. She would leap up or call a servant, and they'd pick up the stone pitcher of water that weighs about 20 pounds, and they'd run down there and fill it with five or six gallons and bring it back so I could have my cup of water. Men didn't carry pitchers of water. Unheard of. Unheard of. And yet, what he's showing here is something amazing because the work of a servant. Uh, this man who once was hostile towards others, this one who has been changed into a different man was now willingly doing the work of a servant. You see, when God steps into a person's life, the hostile part of their life, the part that demands the part that stomps its foot down, the part that has to express its opinion or make its point. When God steps into a life like that and change begins to happen, the first change that you'll ever see is that hostile becomes separated. Now maybe all the sins in a person's life aren't conquered, but that, that inner character of anger, the inner character of rage, the inner character of selfish pride is what's laid low. And that's, that's what makes a man a servant leader. And Jesus is showing his disciples, go into the city, and you're going to meet somebody that you've known your whole life. You've known him. And you've known him to be hostile. And yet you're going to see him, and he's going to be doing the work of a servant willingly. You're not going to find an angry attitude in his heart. You're not going to find a scour on his face. You're going to see a joy-filled man that you know, and he's not going to be the person that you've known your whole life, and he'll be doing the work of a servant. You know, servant leadership is what Jesus has been teaching his disciples since he raised them up as disciples. And that's an amazing picture there. He told them at the beginning of Mark, he says, you know that those who are accounted as rulers over the nation exercise lordship over one another? He says, but their great ones exercise authority on themselves. He said, but it shall not be this way among you. Whoever desires to be great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever of you desires to become first, well, he shall be servant of all. And he gave them the, the example. He says, for the Son of Man, that's Jesus Christ, did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. You've got to think, we believe in a Father, a Son, and a Holy Spirit. That means three persons, one God. That means Jesus, the Father, and the Spirit are God. And that God would come down from heaven, become a man, and begin to walk among us and not demand us to serve him. How many times do we demand others to serve us? And generally, we demand it over those we consider lower than us. And God came down here and became flesh. The book of John tells us the word of God became flesh and walked among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten son of the father. He came down here not to, to be served. But he came down here to serve you and I, to give himself up and to give himself over for us. And he showed us by example. That's how my leaders, you're going to tell my leaders, you're going to tell the ones that I have raised up to serve my people because they're not going to lord it over my people. They're not going to be there for their own gain. They're not going to be there for their own glory. They are there to be a public example of what humility is. A public example of what servant leadership is. You know, he's, he's teaching them. Still, he's, he's about to die on the cross. You think about it. If you knew you had one day, and that, that tomorrow, when 24 hours from that day comes, and you knew it was going to be over, and you knew that your death was going to be being taken prisoner, whipped, scourged, beaten, ridiculed, and mocked. Would you still, and you had a bunch of disciples, would you be still trying to teach them servant leadership? Or would you be trying to set something else up for yourself? And here's Jesus. He's, he's, he knows what he's facing. And yet here he is. He's, he's there, and he's teaching them, this is a lesson. You're going to see this man. He's going to be a changed man. And you, you 
see him. And, and, and then he says, follow him. Amazingly, um, he's carrying a pitcher of water, verse 13. And he says, follow him. Follow him is a term that means be in the same way with him. It means join him as his attendant or be led by him. Or learn from this man. Learn from his example. Because I changed that man, and that man is what I'm making you into. A servant leader. Not someone that's going to be prominent, but someone that's going to lead from a low spot. Verse 14, he says, And wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, the teacher says, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Uh, an amazing thing. So he's, what he's telling them is, you know, he, this man's going to lead you to a home, and when you're there, you say to the homeowner that's there, my teacher says, where's the room that's been made ready for me and my disciples, and he'll show it to you. This is pretty wild. He's telling them, this is what you're going to do. You know, amazingly, part of his disciples, one of his disciples is Judas. And Judas has already set in his heart to betray Jesus. So he knows where they're going, he knows what they're doing, but yet Jesus doesn't make it clear exactly where they're going because Judas is in their midst. Because there's a time for the Son of Man to be betrayed, and it's going to happen in God's perfect timing. So he says, go this, he's going to show you this place, you know, where it is. Um, and it says that they, they brought him, verse 15, and he himself will show you a large upper room furnished and ready and prepared for us. This is pretty awesome here furnished and ready and prepared for us. Okay, you're going to go there. You're going to see this guy that you've known your, forever. He's always been angry. He's always been mad. He's always been hostile. Then you're gonna, yet there's going to be a different, he's a different person. Not only is he a different person, he's, he's laboring in what would have been below his character. Willingly. He's put on the weight of a servant. Unheard of. And, he's, and follow him. Be led by his example. That had to blow their minds. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Follow, follow his example. He's going to lead you to a house. You go into that house. You say to the owner of the house, my master wants to know where we're going to have dinner. And he's going to bring you to a room in his house that's furnished, prepared, and made ready. This is an amazing picture that's painted for us in Scripture here because it literally means he's going to bring you to a room in his home that's supplied with all the right things, that's adjusted and in tune with me, as Jesus is saying, and equipped for all of us. There's a picture painted here for you and I of the preparation of the Passover lamb. How are you and I prepared every day to meet our Passover lamb. That's Jesus Christ. He is active and alive, and he's in our lives each and every day. And every single day, there's a place to meet him. Every single day, there's a place to prepare. And, and what he shows here in this, literally, the place where Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior, dwells with his disciples is always going to be a place that's supplied with all the right things. It's always going to be a place that's adjusted and in tune with him, and it's a place for the equipping of the saints to be sent out to serve the Lord. You know, maybe in your home you say, you know, Lord, I want you to be a part of my life. I really want you to be the Lord of my life. I want you to take over my, my heart, and, I'm, and, and, I, and I lose control every time I'm in charge of my life, and I need help. I need help from you. He's going to say, okay, let me into your heart. Ask me to come in. I'll come in. I will make my home inside your heart. And not only that, I will begin to show you in your home a place where you can safely dwell and be discipled by me. But it's going to cost you something. And what's it going to cost? Well, it's got to be, uh, in, in a way, supplied with the right things. Maybe you need to take some of those magazines out of there and replace it like with the Bible. Maybe you've got to clean house there and start removing things that don't belong. It's got to be, Jesus says, adjusted to me, in tune with me. You see, pornography is not in tune with Jesus Christ, is it? 
Neither is alcoholism. It's not. Neither is drug use. It's not in tune with him. Well, Lord, I remember Joe, Joe uh, Paskowitz one time, a pastor down in Connecticut, uh, when he got saved, and he was smoking pot really heavy. And so he was driving in a van to go to Calvary Chapel in California because he heard this guy was out there sharing the gospel. So they were smoking dope on the way there, just passing the toke. And he's like, I just really got to trust God. It's like, I don't know why I can't do it. <laughs> like, maybe that's why. It's not in tune with him. But what is in tune with him is his word. What is in tune with him is fellowship with him. It's, it's, it's the praise of him. What is in tune with him is his people. You know, I start replacing in my life. I want to be discipled by Jesus Christ. I want to really know God. I want to trust him. I want to know deep inside my sins are forgiven. I want to know that when I stumble, he's there to pick me up. I want to know that his promises are true. I want to know these things. Well, then there's got to be an adjustment on my part. There's got to be an adjustment on my part. Time to move this out. Time to bring this in. Time to settle this score and say, okay, why waver anymore, Lord? You don't want it in my life. See ya. It's gone. I replace it with you. In tune with you. You know, in line with you. And then, and then my dwelling place, my discipleship, becomes in equipping for the saints for the work of the ministry. How are children of God raised up to serve the Lord if, if disciples of God won't change their lives? He says it's so poured out. So he's showing them again a powerful picture. So the preparation for the Passover meal was the job of a servant. And Jesus is showing his disciples that his disciples are never going to be prominent leaders among men, but servant leaders among God's people. And they're going to be leaders who willingly prepare a feast for the children of God to commune with the Lord. That's an important picture that's painted for you and I. God's saying, I want to use you to show other people my love. I want to use you to show other people my son. They've already heard all about my son in some religious way. And everybody doesn't want nothing to do with him. Yet, that's a scary thing. Scary thing. Because I sent my son to save the world, not to condemn the world. So it sounds like the church leaders have given the church the wrong message. And the right message is the message of hope. That God gave his son so that I could be washed clean from my sin. And leave it behind me. And begin to walk forward with him. So the first picture painted there for you and I is in, in this preparation for the Passover meal is that Jesus teaching his disciples what servant leadership is. Now you get to verse 17, like through 21, and, and he's, Jesus is going to talk about being betrayed uh, by Jesus. Verse 17. When it was evening, he came with the twelve. As they were reclining at the table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you that one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. And he began to be grieved and to say to him, One by one, surely it's not I, and he said to them, It's the one who, of the twelve who dips with me in the bowl. For the Son of Man is to go just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better or good for that man to have never been born. So this is the one who, this is Judas, who's going to betray Jesus. In verse 17 and 18, uh, he's letting them know, You know, one of you that breaks bread with me, will betray me. So the breaking of bread here, this communing, what they're eating, it's an awesome thing for the Jewish nation. Breaking bread was a sign of communion and fellowship. It was actually a covenant of union, you could say. Uh, to break bread with someone was like to be in agreement and union with them, and the Jews held it very dear. So if you break bread, it's like you say, okay, I'm in union with you because we are consuming the same thing. I agree with you. Everybody ever been to a wedding? Pretty much everybody, right? Do you ever have cake at a wedding? Do you know why you have cake at a wedding? Because it's sweet? No. Do you know why you have a wedding cake? A wedding cake was given for the purpose of communing with the people. A couple, a husband and a wife stand before the 
pastor. They stand before God. They make this great announcement. We have become one flesh in the sight of God. We stand up and we're in agreement. So everybody in the wedding group are saying that they're in agreement. So if you're not in agreement with who's getting married, you don't go to the wedding. Understand? Forget American tradition. That's garbage. The truth of a wedding. If you don't agree with them getting married, don't go there. Because when you go there, you're saying, I agree with this union. And then when you take the cake, you're communing with them. They're eating it. And it's given out to everybody. And then you eat it. Yes, I agree with this. I am here to see this marriage through because I am partaking in communion with you. I am breaking bread with you. I've broken bread with weddings and people in our fellowship and I am here to see you through. And some people get mad at me because they don't like what I share when they're facing difficulties. Guess what? I broke bread with you. God made the union. And we're going to see it through no matter how difficult it is. Lay down your heart. Lay down your pride. That's what communion is. It's very important. So we take it. It's, so, it's made so lightly today. It's not even funny. And yet, that's why we take the cake. So, this, he breaking bread with his disciples, this sitting down with this Passover meal. And, and he says, one of you who's eating with me, who's sharing, one of you who, who is saying that you're in union with me, one of you who is saying that we are in fellowship together is one of, is one of you who will betray me. And it, and it hits them all, you know, as a shock, except for Judas, but uh, it's an amazing thing. But he says, one of you will betray me. The word betray means to deliver over to another. All right? So it means this. Watch. This is what it means. I'm done with you. You ever hear anybody say that to you? I am done with you. That's what betray means. Powerful word. We use it in our English language today. It doesn't mean anything. Today's day and age. Back then, it meant everything. Everything. It had a full emotion with it. One of you is going to betray me. Hey, I'm done with you. Really, you just took bread with me, and you just proclaimed fellowship with me. And you're done with me? Oh, the one who's got the pride here. All right, because humility doesn't speak that way. Humility betrays nobody. But pride betrays everyone. That's how it runs, and, it, and it, it will never change. So he says, <clears throat> one of you will betray me. Uh, verse 19, they began to be grieved and to say to him, by one by one, surely not I. This is an amazing thing. <laughs> began to be grieved means they were heavy with sorrow. So you got Peter, James, John, everybody but Judas, because we're told in Matthew that Judas, you know, after he begins to dip in the bowl, Judas says, Oh, surely it's not me. We're going to see that uh, as he does it. But uh, they're all like, they look into themselves. It's sorrow and grieving. They looked into their own hearts and they saw only heaviness and sorrow. This is really important because this term, uh, is it I? It means it must be me. That's what it means. You say, is it I, Lord? It's not a question. They looked into their own hearts. If you're a Christian here today and you look into your own heart, what do you see? What do you see when you look at yourself in your own heart? You, it's absolutely me. <laughs> Without a question of a doubt, Lord. <laughs> it's, it is absolutely, there's no question. That's what they're saying. They're not going, do you think it might be me? You know, no, That's what Judas is going to say in a scary way. But they looked into their hearts and they saw their own heaviness, their own sorrow. And literally, they're going, surely it's me. It's got to be me. Thinking, it must be my sin. You know, somehow it's come back to destroy me. Or it must be my life. He must have somehow found out. It must be me. Or we could say, it would be translated this way. Oh, Lord, please say it's not me. <laughs> please. If I look at my own heart, I look deep inside uh, what I see of my life in there, I'm running for my life. But I look to Jesus Christ and I see the open arms 
of fellowship with my Father in heaven. I look at Jesus Christ and I see the bloody nail prints in his hands and I see that God is offering me forgiveness constantly, daily in my life. I run to him and I stop looking at me. I think the reason why a lot of Christians in today's day and age stumble in sin is because they look at themselves. Because if you look at you, what are you going to see? You ever hear that expression, wherever you go, that's, there you are. I mean, you know, you could say, well, I'm going to run way over here. I'm going to move to Africa because that's where I'll find peace. No, I don't think so, man. It's still with you. It's still you. Because wherever you go, there you are. And until the heart is softened and surrenders to the love of God, it won't be conquered. And even when it's conquered, you can still look at it and not like what you see. So you look to the arms of Jesus Christ. You look to the comfort that God gives us in his spirit. And it's an awesome picture that's painted there. So, so they're all around the, the table, and, and they're going, oh, please say it's not me. Please, please, just say it's John or say it's somebody else. But just don't look at me. Don't even look at me, Lord, because it's definitely me. That, that's what they're saying there. And, and then in verse, you know, 21, 20 and 21, um, Jesus says, it's one of the 12 who dips with me in the bowl. You know, he says, for the Son of Man is, is to go just as it is. I mean, God knows he's going to be betrayed. It's not a surprise. God knew he had it planned out. Um, and again, in Matthew, he records that Judas said to Jesus, surely it's not I, Rabbi, after they dip in the bowl. And that statement, when, Jesus, when Judas says to Jesus, surely it's not I, Rabbi, it's pretty wild because it implies you couldn't possibly think it would be me, could you, Rabbi? It's like Judas is speaking over Jesus. When you look at it in Matthew, you'll find out that Judas considered himself above Jesus. So he's speaking down to Jesus. So all the other guys, they're looking at themselves and they're like, I'm toast. It's definitely me. Don't even look at me, Lord. It's me. And Judas is looking down at Jesus going, it can't be me. Don't even look at me. Pass on. And yet it was him all the way. And it's a scary thing. Jesus said it would have been better for that man to not have been born than to reject me. That's what the statement means. It would have been better for Judas not to have been born than to be the one who betrayed me. And yet God knew that he was going to be betrayed. And I think it's an amazing thing. And I think it's true of every human being on earth. You know, it would be better for a human being to not have been born than to reject Jesus Christ. Because he is the only way to heaven. And if you reject him while you're on this earth, and you turn your back from him and you find some other way to go to heaven, then you will find yourself in eternal damnation where you will burn for eternity. That's hell. And that's not make-believe. It's very, very real. The Bible says it's the place where the worm will not die. It means you will be gnawing away at you for eternity of burning because you will have rejected the Son of God who God freely gave to all people. Imagine God giving a free gift of love to every human being on earth doesn't cost anything. You don't get to be religious. You don't get to pay money. You just receive what God gives and you have eternal life with him forever. Imagine that. That someone would say, nope, I don't want that. And God says, it's the only way to spend eternity with me. There's no other way. I gave my son as the bridge, the gap, that gap the, between you and I. There's no other way. No, I don't want it, Lord. I don't want nothing to do with it. Then you will go for eternity in eternal damnation. And that's a scary thing, but it's very, very real, and God doesn't play games about it. Really, it would be better for a human being not to have been born than to reject Jesus Christ as the Savior of all mankind. Uh, when Jesus prayed in John chapter 17, he had his prayer at his called his high priestly prayer. 
He prayed this. He says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so that your son also may glorify you, even as you have given him authority over all flesh, so that he should give eternal life to all you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they might know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. You know, so Judas betrayed Jesus and gave him over to the leaders of the nation who were looking to try him. They were looking to test him. They were looking to testify against him. And they were looking to kill him. Yet, it was all part of God's plan. Amazing. Someone had to play the part. It was offered to anybody. Anybody. And somebody played the part. You know, there's part players today in today's day and age. Don't ever be caught being a part player. God wants you just the way you are. And when you receive him just the way you are, he will make the necessary changes that are needed in your life for you to know him. And from that day forward, it's sanctification. Then you begin to learn in the teaching of his word, oh, you don't want this in my life anymore. Oh, you want me to change here. That's the that's sanctification process. That's not salvation. Salvation is when you come to the realization that Jesus is the Son of God, that he came to this earth as the Passover lamb, that he went to the cross and died on that cross and rose again from the dead as God's free love offering to you and I so that we could be forgiven of all of our sin, be brought to heaven for eternity. That's the main day in everybody's life when you come to that cross. And when you do, it's... uh, to reject that, would I can't even speak of it. can't even speak of how eternal damnation would be. I couldn't even think about what a, no movie on earth could ever express it, how it's going to be. A gnawing away. How many times do you get a gnawing away at something that's driving you out of your mind deep inside? Do you ever have that? You know what it means? Okay? Multiply that times 10 gazillion for eternity, and there's no relief. Imagine if, if my foot was gnawing away, I could cut it off. And in today's day and age, I could get another one. But in eternity, in damnation, there will be no relief ever. The love of God is not in hell. It's everywhere else. But it's not there because God won't let it be there. What's there is damnation for eternity. And it's a scary thing. In Isaiah chapter 53... God tells the nation through Isaiah his plan of his son being the savior of the world and how he would be betrayed because he had to die. It says, but the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief if he would render himself as a guilt offering. If he would, he, he would give him offspring and the good pleasure of the Lord will be the prosper in his hands as a result of the anguish of his soul implying that God said, if my son, when he comes down, if he is willing to die as the guilt offering of the sin of the world, I will multiply his children. Those who are called children of God. Because all anybody has to do is trust him. That's it. And from that day forth begins a brand new life. Uh, Peter tells the Jewish men in Acts chapter 2, when they all come in on the day of Pentecost to hear what was going on, he says, Men and Israelites, hear these words. The words of Jesus of Nazareth, the man approved of God among you by the powerful works and wonders and miracles which God did through him in your midst. He says, As you yourselves also know, this one given to you by the before determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and crucified him, and you have put him to death. Yet God has raised him up and loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that death should hold him. Peter tells the Jewish men that are there, You crucified the Son of God. And yet God had foreseen and had a foreknowledge and he had a plan all laid out that it would be that way because he had to rise again from the dead and he had to be crucified to be the sacrificial lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So his proclamation is one of you is going to betray me and woe to you to the one who does. And it's not that Jesus is going to do something ill towards him. 
It's that that person, by betraying Jesus Christ, has, has brought his life to destruction. And that's a scary thing. A scary, scary thing. A lot of arguments in the churches today. Is Judas in heaven? Will we see him there? Before he hung himself and killed himself, did he repent? Only Judas knows. So don't follow mythical tales. And when you get to heaven, I guarantee you, you won't be looking for Judas. Okay? When you get to heaven, you know, you, people go, when I get to heaven, I can't wait to see my grandfather, man. I got something to say to him. Listen, you ain't going to be looking for your grandfather. When I get to heaven, I can't, you ain't going to be looking. When you get to heaven, you're going to be beholding the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world for 10 gazillion years. Your arms are going to be lifted in praise towards him, and you're going to sing, be singing to him who sits upon the throne. Be glory and honor and majesty to you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You're going to be shouting out his name and, and just being thankful to behold him. You ain't going to go fight. You know, people say, when I see King David, I'm going to go, why did you have an affair with Bathsheba? Yeah, you ain't going to do that. You're going to look at the king. He is the light of heaven. We're told that there's no light. It's him. He's the radiant echoing of light in everything that's there. That's where we're going. We're going to be with him for eternity. And that's an awesome thing. And to reject that. Imagine to reject that because I wouldn't want to be the religious leader or the, or the pastor or the overseer of God's children that redirected somebody away from Jesus Christ. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine leading somebody and saying, well, Jesus came to judge and he, he, he brings judgment. He didn't bring judgment down on nothing. He came down and brought freedom. He came down and brought victory over sin. He came down and paved the way for you and I to be with him for eternity. And there are many there of our loved ones. And we will be with them beholding him on that day. But woe to that person that rejects him because they don't just miss out on that. Because they still have eternal life. When Jesus rose from the dead, eternal life was given to who? The world, everyone. So you choose today where you spend eternal life. Will I spend it with you? There's only one other place. Now you can go pick 5,000 religions today and say, well, there's many places. There ain't. There's two places. One's with him and one's not with him. And to not be with him is eternal damnation. And that's just what it is. That's... You know, scary. So from there, Jesus goes down to verse 22, and he institutes this new covenant, communion. We take this every week. This is what he does. He says, while they were eating, he took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it. He gave it to them. He says, take it. This is my body. When he had taken the cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new uh, in the kingdom of God. This is the institution of a new covenant. He takes the bread, he blesses it, and he breaks it. Okay, so he understands, he's going to say, this bread represents my body. All right? He knows what's going to happen to him in the next few days. They're going to take a bag, they're going to put it over his head, they're going to beat him with rods, they're going to scream into his ear, who hit you? Prophesy. Prophet, prophesy who just hit you. They're going to whip him and flag him, and, and we're going to look at that in, in time to come. But when they whip him with the flagellum, it's so painful that the skin was removed from the back of his head to the bottom of his torso. That's what it did to your back. In fact, the book of Isaiah tells us he was unrecognizable as a human being. Anybody see The Passion? Did you ever see the movie The Passion? Okay, let me tell you, that's nothing. That's Hollywood's version, and that's garbage compared to what he faced. He was a bloody mess and didn't even look like a man. And those stripes are what heal us. Those bloody stripes are what give us hope. Because that bloody mess died and rose again whole to give us eternal life and to freely offer it to us 
an amazing, amazing thing. He understands what he's about to face. And he blesses the bread. I don't know that I'd be blessing bread. <laughs> like, this is my body, Lord, thank you. That the blessing would be, I'm so grateful for this, Lord. We're grateful for that. Hey, I'm grateful for that. I don't know that I'd be grateful if I knew I was facing it tomorrow. Yet he does it. He, he breaks it and he lifts it up and he gives thanks in front of all his friends, amazingly. And he says, this is my body. It means... This represents my body given over for you, okay? We, we take communion. You know, if you grew up Catholic, I grew up Catholic, all right? So we have transubstantiation where the priest does the prayer and it becomes the actual body and blood of Christ. That's a lie. Sorry, it's not true, all right? This is wonder bread, all right? The only wonder in it is it, it's got no eggs, probably. I don't know, but it's just, it's bread, it doesn't become anything else. He's saying, this, it represents my body. All right? This is what is um, going to happen to me tomorrow. He shows him as he breaks it, uh, literally. It represents my body given over for you. The implication here is that from this day forward, after my body is broken, I will become your nourishment. I will become your fellowship. I will become your communion with the Father in heaven. From this day forward, after I go to the cross, my broken body is what is going to nourish you, not the bread. It's going to be my brokenness is what gives you nourishment. My brokenness is what's going to give you fellowship and oneness with the Father. And he lifts it up to him and shows him, Lord, bless this because this is what's going to bring your people. This is what's going to reconcile these men back to you, my body. And he offers it up willingly. He institutes a new covenant, which is what the word testament. You have a New Testament and an Old Testament. The word testament means covenant, literally agreement with all people. So the Old Testament is the law. God gave the nation of Israel, the law. Remember that? When Moses came down and God says, go up, get the law, put on the stone tablets, come on down, give, he got ten laws, keep them. So he gave the laws to the nation. What could the nation not do? Keep them. They couldn't, can't be done. They broke them before he wrote them down. <laughs> they were breaking them while he was writing them down. Moses comes down from the mountain. He's got the Ten Commandments in his hand. He's, Joshua goes, it sounds like war down there. And Moses is like, it ain't war, man. They're breaking all these. The New Testament teaches us that God gave the nation of Israel the Ten Commandments to prove to them what sin was. Because they had no clue what it was. Can I, how far can I go before it's sin? How far can I go before it's, it's I'm condemned? God says, let's make it real clear. These are the Ten Commandments. You break them, you're damned for eternity. As soon as Moses brought them down, they were damned for eternity. So then God gave them a sacrificial system. A way to sacrifice a lamb. Where the blood could be poured out. So that they would come to an understanding. Well, I can't keep these Ten Commandments. I'm trying to keep them, but it ain't happening in my life. Well, that's why I gave you a sacrificial system. So you can offer up blood. Because God said, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. So now the nation has this sacrificial system. Oh, I can't keep these commandments. Oh, God knew you couldn't keep them. Now go sacrifice a lamb. And when you sacrifice a lamb, God's saying you're forgiven. But you're only forgiven for a year. So the law could only expose sin. And the sacrificial system paid the price for the sin only for the year. But it all points to Jesus Christ. That's the Old Testament. What Jesus is saying here when he establishes a brand new covenant, he's showing the nation of Israel and the whole world that he would be the fulfillment of the law by becoming the sacrificial lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. You could say it this way. The Old Testament or the Old Covenant worked in this way. Obey if you want to live. Done. Real simple. Obey to live. And yet the New Testament, and with this 
one sacrifice for all people. It works this way. Live to obey. It's completely different. We don't obey to live. Oh, Lord, I disobeyed you. Well, you're done. Sorry, man. Can't sacrifice lambs no more. My son did it once, and if you reject, it's done. Get out. You're done. Like, wait a minute. The New Testament is live to obey. Oh, Lord, I blew it today. I don't want to blow it anymore. Oh, Lord, I sinned. I don't want to sin anymore. I want to obey you. I want to serve you. I want you to be the Lord of my life. I want you to be the strength in my life. Heart, I want you to be the security for my soul. That's living to obey. We don't obey to live anymore. That was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He fulfilled it when he went to the cross. And he rose from the dead, so now I can live my life trusting my Lord and saying, here, I want to serve you. And, and when I wake up tomorrow, I want to serve you. And should I stumble midway through the day? That's what grace is for. I'd be the fool to turn from Jesus Christ when he's given me the grace to know my Father in heaven. And he's paid the price for me to do it. Yet in today's day and age, people make a lot of money off trying to lead the church down some road it doesn't belong. We follow Jesus Christ and we're forgiven. And God gives us hope. And we press on each and every day. And you know what happens when we stumble? You know what happens when we fail? What are we called to do? You pick your arm up, you lift your brother up, and you keep moving forward. And you say, put it behind you. Put it behind you. Get up and press on forward. And when you learn to live that way, you learn to trust God, your life begins to change. Then you willingly begin to accept the different changes that God might want to bring into your life. In verse 26, it says, After singing a hymn, they went out of the Mount of Olives. This is pretty wild. Um, so they sing a hymn. Actually, when you, during the Passover meal, when they would sacrifice this lamb, before they ate the meal, they would sing Psalm 113 and 114. That's what they sang. They would just sing it, lift praises up to the Lord. Then after they ate the meal, they would sing Psalm 115 to 118. And it's pretty cool, because that's it's what they did. It was something that they, they, they held. They were singing songs of praise to the Lord. They were offering up to God songs of thanksgiving. They were singing of his mercy. They were singing of his loving kindness, which endures forever. This is what they were doing. They were singing. That's what they did. And it's amazing that Jesus is singing. He's, he's the lamb. And yet they, they, they leave. They're singing Psalms 115 to 118. They're just praising the Lord. You know, praise the Lord, I'm going to die tomorrow. <laughs> praise the Lord, your loving kindness is going to be poured out on all these people. Praise the Lord, giving, offering up sacrifice. I just think it's awesome. You just think, of, you know, the Jews even prayed before they ate. Do you know that? And after they ate. You know, you pray before you eat sometimes. They're like, oh Lord, thank you for this food. Bless my family, bless my friends. Then they would pray after it. You wonder why they prayed after Oh Lord, that was delicious. You know, thank you, that was so good. And bless the cook, and, you know, maybe it was like, that was not the Lord, just help this, you know, whatever. Whatever it may be, it was pray. They prayed before and after. They gave thanks before and after. It would be a neat thing to do, wouldn't it? To give thanks before and to give thanks after. You know, I got all these beans. Lord, I pray and after. Please keep this place quiet. Whatever, you know, just whatever it may be. Just pray before and after. Be something to do. And to praise the Lord before and after. It'd be awesome. Uh, just cool. So uh, they're going up to the Mount of Olives. To go to the Mount of Olives, they're going to cross the Kidron Valley. Now the Kidron Valley, so, so you have Jerusalem, it's here. Then you go down into this ravine, this valley. There's a brook down there called the Brook Kidron. And there's a valley, it's called the Kidron Valley. And then the Mount of Olives is on that side. So for Jesus to go there, he's going to go down the Kidron Valley up into the Mount of Olives. But yet it's the Passover time. So the Kidron, the word Kidron means black, as in dried up, stenchy blood, turning black constantly. Because when the Jews sacrificed the lambs, the blood was taken and it had to be poured out. 
So they would pour out the blood into these giant tubes that went down into the Kidron Valley, and it went into the Kidron Brook, and it turned the brook black. So to cross the Kidron Brook through the Kidron Valley, it, it was a stench. It smelled like rotten, putrid blood. And it would just turn black, and, and it would be very dirty and, and not good. And yet, you got 2.5 million Jews. You got well over 250 thousand lambs being sacrificed. That's a lot of blood. And it's being poured down into this brook Kidron. And Jesus is coming down here and he's going to walk through that and his, and his vestige is going to be dipped in blood. His clothing is going to be bloody. Walking through, imagine what he had to be thinking, smelling the smell. That's going to be me tomorrow. Never again, never again at some time will a lamb have to be slain. Never again I will be the lamb of God. That's me tomorrow. Tomorrow my blood is going to run down this brook. But it's not going to turn it into a foul stench. No. See, in his nose as he's crossing the Kidron Valley, it smells bad. It's putrid. It's a stench. But when the blood of Jesus Christ is poured out, it becomes an amazing thing to you and I. It becomes a sweet-smelling aroma in the nostrils of God. And God says, I accept this sacrifice covering the sins of the world. An amazing, amazing thing. The blood that takes away our sins and covers our iniquities. That's the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's an amazing, powerful picture because the word sin means missing the mark. Okay, that's what sin means. Or coming short of. Or coming so far away from redeeming ourselves. Never able to redeem myself back into a relationship with God. Need somebody else to do it. I'm a sinner. I cannot redeem myself. So God sent His Son and His blood is going to redeem me back to the Father. It's going to take my sin away. And all of a sudden, I don't have to fear being reconciled with my Father. It's been done for me through Jesus Christ. I can simply look up to Him and I can trust in Him. And then iniquities, the word iniquity means that's my shortcomings. You know, we say, I stumbled in sin. Actually, we don't really stumble it. We walk headlong into it most of the time. But it's, that's iniquity. It's what I do that God doesn't want done. And so my iniquity, that's what his blood covers. His blood washes my sin away. I never again have to try to be reconciled with my father. He's accomplished it for me. And my iniquities, he's covered them. His blood now covers my iniquities. God will not hold it against me because I'm trusting his son. You understand how that works? His blood has washed my sin away. He has reconciled me to the Father, whether I feel it or not. He's done it by faith. And his blood covers my iniquities. God looks down and says, I don't see him. I don't know how he can do that, but that's what it does. That's why the enemy always comes up. That's why Satan, or the devil, is called the accuser of the brethren. He likes to bring up everybody's garbage that God has already forgiven. And he puts it, you know, put it away. God says it's gone. Uh, an amazing thing. Jesus' blood takes away our sin because he hit the mark for us. His blood covers our shortcomings, our stumblings, our faulty steps, so that we can, by faith, be used of God sharing with others the love and mercy that he's given to us. This is how God uses you and I to share his love with people. We say, okay, Jesus, you died on the cross. You rose again from the dead. God wants me to trust that by faith that I'm forgiven. So I do. I trust you that you died on the cross. You rose again from the dead. And, I, and come dwell in my heart. Come forgive my sin.